I think uh, it's almost four, and I also think the room may be at capacity, so we're going to uh, begin the panel. Uh, <laughs> you're easily pleased. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we just said we like that. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's a program definition of what this panel is supposed to be. Uh, you know, from our point of view, it is the military science fiction panel. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ginger Buchanan. I'm the editor in chief of Ace and Rock Books, which are the science fiction and fantasy imprints of Penguin USA. Uh, and it so happens that all the authors who are on this panel are Ace or Rock authors. Uh, and I'm going to let them actually introduce themselves. Uh, and speak for themselves just briefly, just in terms of saying uh, who you are, and I think this is the point at which you wave your book. So I'll start on my uh, far right, although probably not politically. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Mike Cole, and um, I have the smallest book on the table. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean anything. Size, size does it's not matter. Not, does that no one it's called, it's called that. Control Point. It's the first book in the Shadow Ops series, and uh, the best way to describe it is what uh, Peter V. Brett uh, gave as, as a blur, which is Black Hawk Down meets the X-Men. Um, it's my, uh, my first in a, in a trilogy. It's a special operations unit that uses magic. And as for me, um, this is my first novel, but I've been a comic book and science fiction fan all my life. I'm also an officer in the reserves. I've done three tours in Iraq. And You're answering about seven of my questions. And I just actually got off active duty two weeks ago where I was responding to Hurricane Irene in uh, Cape Bay, New Jersey. in the commercial, tell them when the book will be on sale, Mike. This is, this is uh, show them your author photo, Mike. This is a mock-up. <laughs> this is what the cover will be, but the book actually will be a... Uh, I'm a new 60s guy and a cowboy hat with yeah. beer. Hi, 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 hi. I'm also the shortest guy on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Mike is actually dressed as Taylor's dad. <laughs> Oh, so it's anyway, it's going to be on sale uh, January 31st or, or shortly thereafter uh, of 2012, and I'm actually going to be signing with these two gentlemen uh, at 5.15 at the Penguin. Uh, we have some advanced reading copies, some galleys. To my immediate right. Uh, I'm John G. Hamry. I write also under the name Jack Campbell, uh, the pen name. I'm a uh, retired baby. Uh, this is uh, my latest book, uh, Lost Fleet, Beyond the Frontier, Dreadnought. Uh, the titles keep getting longer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it's basically old fashioned space opera uh, with a, a hero who's uh, trying to live up to the legend of what people think he is. And uh, he doesn't always succeed, but he does his best. And there's bad guys, and in this one we've got some aliens to show up. So, lots of fun traditional tropes. And to my immediate left, again, I'm not sure politically. Uh... My name is Taylor Anderson. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us our editor? <laughs> this, this is the latest book in my uh, Destroyerman series. It's uh, number six. Uh, <clears throat> unlike these gentlemen, I was ignom ignominiously expelled from the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 with a, not with a dishonorable, I just played too much football <laughs> and ruined myself. Uh, the the Destroyerman series is kind of, well, it's alternate history to, a, to an extent. I, I, I kind of prefer to call it military, his, historical military science fiction. That would probably be a better description. It, uh, Picks up at the end of the uh, Battle of the Java Sea historical event, 1942. Uh, uh, the, the, the U.S. Asiatic fleet was composed of World War I relics, essentially. And they wind up getting all shot to pieces, as was historically the case, and wind up in an alternate universe. Simple enough. We're surprised the war is going on. Taylor neglected to mention that he actually teaches military history and has a lot of experience building his own armaments and uh, consulting on all those odd 
Discovery and History Channel things where there are reenactments and stuff like that. Well, we're, I've done some movies where cannons were involved. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves a cannon. Yes. Uh, again, again, people were answering uh, questions ahead of time, and my second question was going to be, what is your military background? And I think everyone has already answered that. But I, I, then I would think we'll go to the third question. The only person who really answered that was Mike, which is, what is your background in reading science fiction and fantasy? Mike, you had, you had sort of gone there, but you can sure. elaborate if you want. Um, I, uh, I am a classic D&D nerd. I started out... <laughs> <laughs> no, but like I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break up and cry because like I mean, I started with the with the blue book cover and the box set that my brother bought home when I was 13, and then my mom took me to the mess and the arms and armor hall, and that was it. And it never went away. We to go out of it. Um, and uh, I went on to gra uh, graduated to hanging out at the comic book shop, and then. Uh, and then went on to paperback novels. And like I'm sure everyone in this room, judging by all the whoops we just heard, you know, I started out with Tolkien and Terry Brooks and, and, uh, and some Robert Jordan. And right now, my favorite authors are Jack Campbell. It's fantastic to, to be sitting next to him. Sorry, it's, it's embarrassing. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the blurb to my book. Um, but his Lost Fleet series is absolutely dynamite. It's incredible space battles um, with, with real physics in them. I'm a huge fan of Peter B. Brett. Uh, uh, Demon Cycle, The Warded Man in the uh, Desert Spear, Naomi Novix, who's, uh, who's done the, um, the Tamarera series, which is military fantasy, if, uh, although uh, in a Jane Austen mode. Um, and I a massive, massive, no, so, uh, they were officers and gentlemen back then. And I'm a sea service officer, I love, so I love all of that protocol and, uh, and naval stuff. And I'm a huge, huge comic book fan. Um, and I, uh, Scott Kirkman is here, and I will, I'm not going to bother to try to meet him because the line is going to be out the, out the door. And Marjorie Liu is here, who uh, is also an ace author writing romance novels, but she writes X-23 and Dark Wolverine and a lot of that kind of stuff. So. Um, and that's about like 2% of the stuff I'm into, but uh, I don't want to suck up all the air, so I'll turn it over to other folks. John, what about you? Um, I think the first SF fantasy I read was uh, very young, read uh, one of Edgar Rice Burroughs Mars books. Edgar Rice Burroughs, he's kind of like the crack cocaine of YA literature. It's how you get sucked in. And um, after that, I was heavily into Silver Age comics, uh, especially the Legion of Superheroes. Uh, Shadow Lass uh, was a lasting influence, the original version. Um, then moved on, uh, a lot of the, the classic authors, people like Andre Norton and uh, Lee Brackett, who helped write the screenplay for Empire Strikes Back. Robert Heinlein, uh, James Schmitz, I've been reading his, uh, re -reading his tells you stories lately. And nowadays, uh, there's a lot of good authors out there, such as these two gentlemen, <laughs> and um, Elizabeth Moon, David Sherman, um, gosh, there's just so many. Buy all the books you can. <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff out there these days. Was there a point where you stopped? It sounds like Mike never did. But did you ever go through that, oh, this is kid stuff, and then come back to it? No, no. <laughs> no, I never went through a period when uh, uh, it was kid stuff. Um, there was a period when a lot of the stuff that came out was very dark and depressing, and that never did much for me. I figured if I'm going to read a book, it's to entertain me, and I don't want to get out of it wanting to slip my wrist. <laughs> and uh, when I was on CD, it was kind of hard to get books back in those days. So, but uh, other than that, I always stuck with it uh, because um, there's always something new coming on. Always some new approach, new ideas, new authors. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting, that way. It's very much a living field. Taylor? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The, the first comic book I ever remember actually picking up and reading was, and this will probably take me, I don't even know if they're still available, but Weird War. Wow. Lord. Anybody remember those? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they were weird. Yeah. They, were, they were weird. They were weird. Uh, made a, a lot of them into uh, uh, Twilight Zone-like episodes. But it, it was interesting. Uh, of course, early classic Heinlein, 
uh, and I, I just it, it was science fiction fantasy was always what I turned to for entertainment. I, I had to read history, do history. I did history so much that I mean I still do history in the in the books that I'm doing, but I get to play with it, and that's a lot of fun. Everything else I did was always it had to be absolute, whether it was in the movies or teaching or or building a specific firearm that was supposed to be used in a certain way, certain by a certain person. And like like I said earlier, I just, I just wanted to play with history. And but I I still absorb science fiction whenever I can. I was I was telling uh, I prefer Jack. <laughs> oh yeah, either one. <laughs> well, I was telling him I've I've heard about him, and everybody says wonderful things, and I have not yet had a chance to read him, and I'm going to. Have to. to send you his. Well, <laughs> lately, and, and what he just said, when you're writing, you don't get near the chance to read that you, you used to to have, and that's true because I've been reading tech manuals and stuff like that. But I've got a huge pile of my favorite authors that is. Probably gonna fall over and murder my wife's cat. <laughs> Accidentally on purpose. Yeah. Accidentally, yeah. Everybody who uh, writes, whether they set out with that as a goal, as a full-time career, or whether it becomes something uh, that they're doing while they're doing something else, or whether it becomes something they do after, you know, they, they at a later point in their life, it has to make a decision about what they're going to write. Uh, what led uh, all of you to uh, the to what you decided to write? Uh, Mike, uh, your work, for instance, is um, military fantasy. I guess is the best way to describe it. But why did you go in that direction? Why not straight military? Why not straight fantasy? Uh, now, why did you uh, uh, make the authorial authorial decisions that you made? Um, and the the idea for the original title for Control Point was latent, and the idea came to me when I was working in the Pentagon. I uh, I've only been an officer in uniform for under four years, but my first two tours in Iraq were done as a mercenary, and I know that a lot of people um, roll their eyes at that. Um, but I, I still feel pretty proud of that and feel like I was doing, um, you know, doing important work on the ground and, and still helping people. Uh, my third tour was, was, was as, an actual, uh, as an actual government representative. Um, but in the Pentagon, uh, when you work there, you notice there's a, it has a distinct culture. And that culture is, I hate to say it, extremely internally suspicious. It's extremely rigid. Um, and it has to be because there's information that has to be protected. There's, um, uh, there's this almost cult-like adherence to this thing called OPSEC or Ops, Operational Security. And you have an enormous organization of hundreds and thousands of individuals who are very unique. Some with all beliefs all across the political spectrum and, and personalities all across the spectrum, and yet they are all caught up in this very, very rigid culture. Well, <clears throat> you take that and you put a huge nerd in it. And, uh, and I sit there, sit there thinking, well, there was an elk. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like, and you know what to laugh at me because you all do the same thing. You know, I don't write Dumb 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 What if Dobby was working the deep fryer? <laughs> like you do, you totally do. So, so I did, and I'm not going to be ashamed of it. And, um, and I started thinking, well, what if, what if people had magic? Like, what, if, what would the army do with that? You know? And the answer is they'd mess it up. Um, they'd make it boring. They'd wrap it in red tape. And they'd destroy people's lives um, uh, over it. And they'd also do amazing things with it um, and make people's lives better. Because any institution as big and as, as complex as the military does those kinds of things. And I began spinning it out from there. And the first novel was, I wrote it in 1998. Um, and it went through a, tons and tons of iterations. Um, and it began to evolve as I did service overseas, and then when I finally put on the uniform myself. Um, and I think it crystallized uh, about a year and a half ago, and it, I think it really was my experience in Iraq that finally gave it the oomph it needed to attract the attention of an agent and to, and to, and to be published. Um, and the other thing that I really wanted to do is that we have Sword and Sorcery. I don't know, how many of you folks remember Fritz Lieber and the Fard and the Grey Mouser? I mean, I know that Oh my god, there's like five hands <laughs> right up. Yeah. Okay, so, 
Actually, it's very encouraging that there's young people, you know, that are that are that are reading this stuff. Okay, but that was. Mine, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> yes, that's right. The, the, uh, but part of the gray mouser is people of all ages. That's, that's right. Okay. That's what I meant. Yeah. Um, is that uh, is that like that? Sword and sorcery is a known quantity, right? It really is. And then there's a lot of like really hard age, hard edge military science fiction. I don't know if you guys have seen the Old Republic trailer that's going on at Delray. It blows my mind. It's so awesome. Like, we've got spire team level and squad level tactics in space, um, and we've got a lot of sword and sorcery. But what we don't have is gun and sorcery. We don't have counterinsurgency focus, blurring the line between law enforcement and military. Like, how does an Apache Longbow gunship stand up to a dragon? You know? <laughs> how do you action a target? How do you do dynamic direct entry, soft style entry? You know, the bad guys are barricaded inside the house and we're going to take them down. Oh, and by the way, three of us can cast fireballs. You know? How does that change the, change the scene? And then, of course, the larger questions come out of that. How does it change it tactically? And how does it change it socially? Um, and, and, how does that, and how does society adapt around that? And that's really what, what led to that authorial position. Of course, part of it was just it's, it's really cool to pick helicopter gunships and ask dragons. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't underestimate the importance of cool. I uh, actually Pentagon gave me the impetus for my first published novel, which was the Stark's War book. Um, it was uh, my last active duty tour. And coming out of there, I was pretty disgusted with uh, micromanagement, politics, things like that. So I wrote a book about where those things might lead, and uh, what sort of person we might need to get us out of that situation if it leads to. And then after that, as those books were coming out, I uh, was on a panel at a convention, which was uh, entitled The People versus James T. Kirk. <laughs> I met you it was, Yes, it was intended to, uh, you know, how many crimes can we charge James T. Kirk? <laughs> One of my jobs in the military had been a collateral duty legal officer on the ship, so I was able to explain all the ways in which James T. Kirk could get out of being charged with it. <laughs> There's actually loopholes galore. And after that, one of the ACES editors said, you should write a military legal science fiction series, which I did, and that ran four books starting with just determination. Uh, but then when that series came to its end, I'm looking at the next thing to do. Uh, I've always loved space opera. Always loved the, the grand adventures. Um, they're not seen as much anymore. We, we've still got Star Wars and uh, Star Trek's uh, kind of shaky. Um, <laughs> but the idea of doing that and doing it real, what would it really be like actually doing the ships in three dimensions when they encounter each other, actually emphasizing how big the thing is by sticking to light speed limits. So, ships of light. The other ships are a light hour away. You can see what they were doing an hour ago. You don't know what they're doing right now. Things like that. If you want to talk to somebody, it takes an hour for your message to get to them, if they're that far away. Uh, working all that in and also focusing it on people, the characters. Because there's a, a common legend in a lot of cultures of the hero who isn't really dead. He's just sleeping and someday he's going to come back. King Arthur is the one most people know about in the West. But the 12th Imam in Islam is the same sort of thing. And there's many other examples. And so I thought, okay, there were real people behind these legends. What would happen if they really did wake up in the future and found out what everybody else thought they were? And found out that everybody else was expecting them to save them because they were in big trouble. <laughs> and that's uh, the, what the, the main character in the, the Lost Fleet books has to do. He's, everybody's there saying, you're our hero, you can do anything, and we're trapped deep in enemy territory. Save us. And he's like, what? <laughs> Who do you think I am? Um, and yet he realizes that he's got to try and live up to this uh, reputation to save the people who depend on him. And so it creates a, an awful lot of uh, dynamics that I can play with. Uh, the fact that there's been a war going on for a century and the bad effects that's had on the military and the culture as a whole. Uh, there's a lot of things I can get into, and uh, a lot of people have responded very nicely to it. It's, it's, it's a space opera, and yet it's a real space opera. It feels like it's, it's actually could be happening. Taylor, if I recall correctly, your actual um, area of expertise 